welcome everybody. And I certainly want to say, I'm not sure, oh yes, in this session we do have people that are actually not from CQU. So last year this conference was CQU only. And so I've got to say, I think it's fantastic that we have people from other universities and other places, sessional teachers, full-time. I think this is fantastic. What a great way for us all to share that, um, that scholarship. Um, that, we, that we're all working on, because we all have different ideas. Um, and in the tea room, Glow made a statement about how with our giant footprint, uh, we tend to miss those corridor conversations or the water cooler conversations that sometimes leads to great ideas growing. Um, I think we should get started, does everyone agree? Yeah, we're doing the, I don't know what this is about, but I think it's spirit fingers, like interpretive dance. So we'll, we'll just carry out with that. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so um, I'll officially welcome you all now. Welcome everybody. Thank you for participating and thank you to all the present, uh, presenters for your presentations. So this session will be recorded and all session recordings will be accessed through a YouTube channel which will be sorted out in due course. If you miss a session or if one of the sessions clashes with another one that you'd like to see clearly, that, that's to assist you and you'll be able to sit, watch it later on in the recordings. So the theme for this session is educational assessment and evaluation. So this theme includes authenticity and assessment, assessment that incorporates academic integrity, such as reducing plagiarism or contract cheating, social innovation in assessment design, embedding clinical practice or work integrated learning into assessment, innovative techniques to ensure student success, uh, quality of content and curriculum design, digital badging and micro-credentials and or attrition and retention. So quite a lot is covered in this one. There will be an evaluation for the session and I'll post the link into the chat after we get started. And you are being asked to complete the evaluation for every session that you attend. So if you attend more than one, please complete the evaluation for each session that you attend. The evaluation is really quick to complete, I promise. Um, and you can complete the evaluation during the session and I absolutely encourage you to do that. The idea is that it helps us um, evaluate everything and see what works and what doesn't. So um, please keep your questions for each presenter until the end of our session. So we'll have the presentations first and then have a, a one question session for all presentations. That keeps things moving along. Uh, we are keeping strictly to time and I will be letting you know. So each presenter will have 10 to 15 minutes for their presentation. And I will let the presenters know at 10, 12, 14 minutes and then ask you to stop at 15. I think the easiest way to do this uh, to avoid any technical hiccups is I will literally open my microphone and I will say 10, 12 or 14. Does that work for the presenters? Thank you very much. Tobias, Joe, oh, I can see you waving. Um, is it Shah? Yeah, I said it right. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so that, that I'll do it that way just quickly so that you've, you've heard me. Um, really need to remind you, if you are not presenting and not asking a question, please keep your uh, microphones muted. It does create a, um, a feedback loop um, and it does create an issue and, and it can cause problems. So I would now like to introduce our first presentation. The presentation is entitled Academic Misconduct, Perspectives of Sessional Academic Staff. I would like to welcome Dr. Joe Luck from CQ University, Dr. Ritesh Chug. Chuck? Yep, that's right, Chug. Yep, thank Chug. you. Thank you uh, from CQ University and Mr. Edward Pember from CQ University. So welcome and please take it away. So if you'd like to share your screen. Yes, hi, thank you very much for that, Sharon. Joe Luck here. I've got my presentation all ready to go as per the instructions. Um, the one thing, I thought we had 10 minutes to present and five minutes for questions. So uh, my presentation may go a bit short, but that's okay. Um, that's, that's fine, Joe. sorry for interrupting. The purpose of the 10 to 15 is to allow for those shorter ones or people then can talk. And we only have four for our, um, our room t this morning. So we've got a little bit of leeway to play with and still fit the criteria from Celeste. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, hi and welcome. Um, this is really interesting. First time I've done a presentation from my office uh, for, one of, for one of these conferences. So I thank you for the opportunity. So what uh, we three are reporting back on and my colleagues on this project are on the um, 
uh, also present in the room, is uh, we got, managed to get a SALT grant last year, which we're running this year. Um, and um, we've got uh, ethical clearance here to report on the data that we found for that. So what we're looking at is the pers perspectives. Now, for some reason, oh yeah, that's working. Uh, we're looking at the perspectives of uh, sessional academic staff. And that's not to say that full-time academic staff, that we're ignoring them. Uh, we just feel that at CQU, well, especially in our school, uh, well, Ritesh and I are both in engineering and technology. We have a heavy reliance on sessional staff teaching in the information communication technology side of the school. Um, we just feel that they, you know, they don't always have the professional development opportunities and opportunities to participate um, in things like that as, as what the full-time staff would. So, so our project concentrated on the special needs of the sessional academic staff, but we feel that the findings will be relevant to the wider community. So I just want to state that up front. So the need for the project. So what we're looking at is, is people's perceptions of academic integrity and misconduct. And um, this is evidenced by that technology has allowed people to, to increase the, the opportunities for plagiarism and academic misconduct and how they do it. Um, we also feel that one of the issues, and I don't think this is specific to CQU, but one of the issues is that staff need to have a common understanding of what uh, academic integrity is, academic misconduct, so that when we're applying policies or we're moderating assessments or anything like that, that we all, you know, are reading from the same hymn sheet, so to speak, um, with that there. Um, I've talked about the, the reasons for why we're focusing on sessional staff and also with TEXA. Uh, you know, TEXA requirements are very much about, you know, academic integrity, etc. So this study, which, we, you know, which we wrote over last year, and I think I see Josh was uh, in on the session. Thank you very much for the professional development that we all received while developing the grant. That was a, a, a very supportive process that we went through last year. So with this study, we aim to fill this gap. And what we want to do is like there's a three... Uh, Three things that we want to achieve from this transformational impact, and that is that our graduates have this common understanding of what academic misconduct is and academic integrity, the importance of that, that we have a transactional impact so that when we're in the classroom and we're teaching the students and having conversations with the students, that again, we have a common understanding of what's meant by academic um, integrity. And also that it has an institutional impact, you know, the reputation of the institution is very important. Um, and, and so, you know, it is, it is good for all of us that the graduates that come from here are good corporate citizens. And, you know, that's one of the themes that uh, Nick Comp talked about in his keynote address this morning. So, as I said, so central to this is looking at um, what the session academic staff feel about teaching academic integrity and dealing with academic misconduct. So what we've done so far is we've done the data collection and analysis. And um, so we did two, uh, two hour focus groups and we mainly concentrated on staff in the Sydney and Melbourne campuses because that's where there's a larger uh, groups of ac uh, sessional academic staff that were available to us to, to speak to. And so far we've, um, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, sorry, employed a research assistant to, to help us, um, you know, uh, using tools to help us to come up with the themes of that. So with these, we were, we were lucky we got um, nine students, in, uh, nine students, nine staff in Sydney and nine staff in Melbourne. And we, they've, um, you know, we put all of those into, uh, into a folder. They came up, sorry, the files, we came up with the themes of that. And um, we're now drawing the con conclusions on that. So that's one aspect of the data collection we've done is talking to these staff, some of them very long-term staff who've, who, you know, have got years of experience and, and very rich data that we collected. Um, and then there were a couple that were newer staff that, um, that we were able to talk to there. Uh, a second aspect of the data collection is that we're, we're doing an audit of existing resources at CQU and also resources that are available to us in the literature, um, you know, previous um, learning and teaching grants that were done, you know, like uh, Australia, um, uh, 
sponsored, you know, Australia wide by that. <laughs> so I've just forgotten the name of the scheme, but you know, we used to have that national scheme that supported some studies as well. And uh, I'm grateful because I see Renette and um, Mari and a few other people from CQU involved with plagiarism are, are also in the audience today, which is wonderful. So with our preliminary findings, and so these we have pulled from the data um, we have there. So these appear to be the most common problems that were um, identified by the session academic staff, contract cheating. And again, that's been a theme that the university has been uh, trying to address for at least a year that I know of. And it was really interesting what some of the staff said about that. Um, a comment that sticks out in my mind is the, the one that's uh, on the screen at the top there, that students had told a staff member that they, that the, for them working, they were getting paid more per hour to work in their part-time job than, it, than, it, than they had to pay to get somebody to write their assessment for them. So, you know, the, the, the quote was, it was more profitable to either purchase or copy and paste from the internet rather than spending the time on the assessments because that time they could spend because they were earning like $30, $35 an hour in their job and it was only costing them $20 an hour to pay for somebody else to write their assignment. Um, so that to me was a really scary statement uh, that they made there um, that economically the students felt it was better uh, to, to buy their assignment rather than write it themselves. Uh, another theme that, that was quite common was inappropriate referencing. And so this uh, quote that we've got there is just typical of several of the, of the statements that were made by the staff. Um, they've, you know, they falsify citations um, or the citations just randomly pop up in the text. Um, when you go and you look at the actual reference list, the citation, you know, the citation might be about mental health and nurses, and yet they're using the citation to support a statement about, um, you know, the Internet of Things. Um, and, and so they think, oh, that you're just looking for references. They don't understand that, you know, the reference has to support the statement that's in their actual report. Um, another thing was the manipulation of plagiarism detection software. Uh, again, that was a, a fairly common theme that came through, uh, how difficult it is for staff if they just rely on the Turnitin software, because, you know, you can easily just go in and uh, to Google and Google sites that say, how can I cheat Turnitin? And, you know, there's a whole series of sites that will come, not through CQU service now, but you can do it through your private internet provider. And, um, and so, it, then it makes it really hard because it's not, you don't have this clear evidence with the Turnitin report saying that this has been copied um, because what they, they're doing is they might be cutting and pasting and putting, putting the other people's words into their assignment, but then they use a synonym generator to change, you know, every seventh word or every eighth word. Or again, they have false citation of references or they might even have false references in there. And so Turnitin can't pick those up because um, I've actually seen assignments where students have used the synonym generator, not just on the, what they write in the assignment, but they also use the synonym generator on the actual references themselves. So, of course, the references don't match up in Turnitin because they, you know, they've changed the names of some of the words in the, the title of the, the journal article or whatever. And um, another theme that came through strongly was academic dishonesty. So, um, uh, in uh, information and communication technology and also some of the staff we interviewed were, were from business and law, um, a lot of those students are international students, you know, more than 95% of them are international students. So then they would talk about how they're coming from a different system uh, and, you know, they're, they're used to in their own country, it might be okay to copy and paste or to use the professor's words back in the assignment. And so they were talking about how hard it is to mentally get the students to shift from this copy and paste culture to, no, we want you to write assignments in your own words up there. So implications of this, um, we were looking at ways to identify how to build academic in integrity concepts into our teaching. And one of the things we want to do and working with the staff from learning and teaching services is, is you know, to, to create this module or to, you know, to um, help them with one of the modules they've already got that, that we have not only it's is it something that can be used for staff development with staff, but also to have resources in there so that they can, you know, like have a pre-prepared PowerPoint that they can download and use in their teaching, for example. 
Um, so, so that's one of the things that we're looking at building. Um, we want to help them to uh, adapt their teaching practices so that academic integrity is just part of the everyday teaching. It's part of the language they use in every class that they have with the students. Um, Ten minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Um, so another thing is to have activity-based resources there. So again, resources that they can, so you don't have to you know, spend hours creating your own resources. You can pull down resources um, from, from this site um, and then you know, just adapt it to your own purposes. And also hopefully to have something in there about how to design assignments to, to reduce the academic misconduct interest, uh, incidents you know, and, and hopefully to you know, make it less easy for students to copy and paste or get somebody else to write it. Um, in the future, in the future, what we want to look at is, you know, more at strategies to mitigate the academic integrity problems, um, but that's outside the scope of the current project that we're doing. So next step. So as I said before, we've collected the data. Um, we're currently in the process. We've got drafts of uh, two papers that we're writing. Um, we've had to create uh, a, a site in Totara, not Moodle. Uh, so we, we've got a, like a, a shell there. So we have to teach ourselves how to use Totara. And as I said, working with LTS staff to make sure that, that we're not um, uh, repeating or overlapping with something that they're doing. Um, so it's just that we want to create this resource kit um, with activity, pre-prepared pre activities, guidance for all staff, whether they're sessional or full-time or whatever, um, with the strategies in there to, uh, to help them teach. Uh, and also to encourage. So what I should have said at the beginning is the name of our project is Prevention is Better Than Punishment. So what we're about and what we want to aim to do is to sort of like teach the students and empower the students and tell them why it's important to have, you know, that, that they practice academic integrity and that they write their own assignments because it'll help better prepare them for the world and then they're good corporate citizens and, and working in the Australian uh, workplace if that's what they choose to do. Um, so minutes. Okay, so the yeah, strategies are all about, you know, teaching them so that they have the skills themselves. Um, and the last part of the SALT grant is actually evaluating the toolkit and then getting... Um, you know, feeding that back in so to improve that with that. So again, we'll be looking back to the sessional staff that we spoke to earlier to help them evaluate that. And that, uh, apart from the references, that is the end of my um, presentation. Thank you. And um, I don't know, Sharon, you want to have questions at the end, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Thanks, Joe. So thank you very much, Joe. Can I get everyone to please thank Joe for her presentation and, her time and to her team as well. Please, um, please thank them all. Um, could I please ask that Sha'ola, have I pronounced that correctly? Please? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Beautiful. Yeah. Are you ready to go, Sha? Yeah, I am, yeah. Okay, just bear with me because I'm a bit um, technically gifted as well and have to reset the timer. Oh, that's okay. So I'll... So just let me know when you're ready to go. And everybody, I'd like to introduce Sha'ula, um, who is presenting Preventing Contract Cheating at CQ University. Can I please uh, welcome you and when you're ready to go? Perfect. Is that okay, everyone? Can everyone see the screen and hear me? Yeah, that's good. Excellent, great. Uh, so welcome, everyone. And thanks, Joe and Sharon. What a wonderful uh, SALT grant project that is. It's really uh, exciting. And I too, like Joe, presenting for the first time in a virtual conference, and I find it really fascinating. To, just to give you a context, if I look on my right, I'm at the Glaston Marina campus uh, here in central Queensland. If I just look at my right, I see this beautiful boat that takes you directly, probably in three hours, to Heron Island, uh, which is the Great Barrier Reef. Uh -huh. So uh, welcome, everyone. So today I want to discuss about some of the techniques and the strategies that, that I've implemented in the courses that I coordinate here uh, in civil engineering at CQ University. So the title of my presentation today is How, How We Can Prevent Contract Cheating. So uh, if I want to look at the problem, there are two key questions. Uh, you can call a research question that I want to answer. So the first one is that if I look into all the literature surrounding contract cheating. Okay, so there's a range of different definitions that different authors adopt. And at the same time, there's a range of different definitions that universities all around the world adopt. 
So even if I narrow it down to Queensland, and if I look at the seven public universities that we have, all of them, they sort of adopt slightly different uh, versions or slightly different definitions. So first I want to sort of define contract treaty in a manner such that all the stakeholders associated with uh, contract treaty, that is the university, uh, the student, of course, and the contract treating service providers, all this relationship, this relationship is catered for within the definition. Okay, so that's uh, my first uh, research question. And the second one is that uh, I argue here is that to prevent or to curb contract cheating in the first place. Okay, so designing the assessment is the way forward. Okay? Because as Joe said, if you remember that, prevention is better than punishment, right? Prevention is better than cure. So that's the approach I would like to take. Because nobody, nobody, I think, although we have legal laws and things like that and a discussion surrounding, surrounding laws, uh, nobody wants to spend time in the court, okay? So because we lose valuable staff time and other university staff time in the process. For instance, if you look at the RMIT contract cheating case, that took two years to resolve. One single case took two years to resolve. So that's a lot of investment in terms of money and in terms of time that I think we need to think about. So I argue here that authentic assessment is the way forward uh, to use contract cheating. And the question is then how can we prepare our assessments so that they're authentic and so that they do not end up in uh, SMLs somewhere online. So here I propose a, a new revised definition of contract cheating. So first of all, I start off by saying that contract cheating it is an academic misconduct. Okay. So it's very important that we first classify it as an academic misconduct. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that the university's own academic misconduct policies are such that they can efficiently tackle uh, the contract cheating cases that may occur. So in general contract cheating, what we mean is that they outsource the assignment or any, parts, or any parts thereof to third parties, okay? And if I look at third parties, I mean, it can be friends and family members, it can be paid or unpaid, okay? And later this work is submitted. This work is submitted for grading. So the last two lines are really very important and this comes from the student point of view. So from empirical observations and talking to different students, many students, they have the idea that you can- I'm sorry for interrupting. If you have your microphone on, could you please turn it off? You are disturbing the presenter. Um, Sharon, someone called Zara that's doing it. Um, Zara, if you thank you very much. Um, apologies to Shah. Please continue. Apologies for that. Oh, that's fine. Uh, so the last two lines are really very important. So if I study the whole 15 years of literature on contract cheating, starting from 2006 up to 2019, what I find is that these two uh, two lines at the end, they're not really catered for, and these these directly come from the student's point of view. So rewriting any or all uh, parts of the uh, assignment is still considered to be contract cheating. Okay? So that's, that's uh, one statement that I want to make. And the other one is that it does not matter whether the student understands the solution or not. Okay? If, because the solution, uh, firstly, the solution was obtained by an illegal means. Okay? So it does not matter whether the student uh, understands or is able to withstand any scrutiny afterwards. Okay, so, so that's what I mean overall by contract cheating. So rewriting all or any parts thereof, with or without understanding of the content, still classifies as contract cheating. So that's answering the first question. Now let us move on to the second question. So how do I now prepare, okay, assessment that are authentic, that are less likely to end up uh, online? Uh, so recently, uh, led by, I think, the University of South Australia, Pretag and others, they did a huge survey. I think there were 14,000 students participating in that survey. 
And what came out from that survey is that uh, we need assessments that are more authentic. Okay, we need research-based questions, okay, things like that. So here I developed a framework which I called, which I call the CPACS approach. Okay, CPACS approach. So the acronym CPAC stands for this. So C is for contextualization. Contextualizing. So by contextualization, I mean developing a broader con context of the assessment item. Okay. So the context of the problem, whether if I'm asking for designing a bridge, okay, if it's a construction project, okay, or a bridge which connects two main roads, okay, things like that. Okay, they, so a broader context is necessary within an assessment item that we prepare. So the, uh, within the context, okay, we should sort of clarify the problem that we want the students to solve, okay, and the merit of solving the problem should be very clear. Okay? So developing the context is very important. And the second thing which I sort of borrow from studies on psychology is that the personalization aspect. Okay? So a personalization is very important ingredient of an authentic assessment as well. And personalization can be added to any assessment question as I'll show you some examples later on. So personalization can be added by using proper nouns, name of places, name of students. Okay? So personalization helps to develop a sense of belonging, which is very important, uh, I think, uh, in terms of preparing authentic assessments. And the three very important criteria which sits in the middle uh, within CPAT is that authenticity. Okay. Now, again, if you look at the literature, authenticity is defined by different scholars in different ways. Okay. So a lot of people agree that an assessment to be authentic means that we assess the same range of skills and attributes that a student will experience in a real workplace. So here within CPATs, I define authenticity as a unique piece of assessment. Okay. I define authenticity as a unique piece of assessment that is less likely to be outsourced uh, that is less likely to be outsourced via any uh, contract cheating uh, medium. Okay. So we can discuss what makes an assessment unique uh, if you have any questions later on. So authenticity is uh, the third uh, important parameter that I'm looking at. The fourth parameter is that of complexity. So C for complexity. So the assessment item that we prepared, it can't be too complex. Of course, if, if you make it too complex, then it's, it is likely that it might end, still end up or outsource somewhere. So here I would like to introduce the idea of adequate complexity. Okay, it can't be too easy. It can't be uh, too complex. So it's somewhere in the middle, uh, which the lecturer or the, or the person who's preparing the assessment can uh, use their judgment on that. Okay. So what complexity does is it helps uh, it makes the solution expensive. Like it makes the solution expensive. So if there is adequate complexity within the assessment item, it is more likely that the solution of that, even if it's outsourced, it's going to be expensive and that can work as a deterrent. And the final uh, ingredient is storytelling. Okay. So overall, all the three ingredients, the contextualization, personalization, authenticity and complexity, they should tie and balance each other beautiful, beautifully. And at the end, when you read the assessment question, the overall story, the picture, the motivation, it should be all clear and everything sort of ties nicely and fits in together. So that's the CPAC, uh, what CPAC stands for. And here on the right, you can see what CPAC wants to do actually. So CPAC wants to develop a sense of belonging. Okay. A sense of belonging is very important uh, from a human psychological perspective. Uh, it promotes authenticity, okay? it promotes independent learning, and it tries to prevent outsourcing of the assignments. Ten minutes, Sha. So what CPAC does not guarantee is that if you follow this approach, okay, it does not 100% guarantee that students will not contract cheat or use contract cheating services. Okay? Because the contract cheating itself if you study it deeply, it's very complex. And there are a number of other reasons why a student might contract cheat. 
even though your suspect is authentic. Stress, lack of time, not wanting to, not wanting to persevere, they are all valid and good reasons for a student to sort of outsource the assessment or assignment. So here I would like to give you a quick example of CPACs. Okay. So, uh, so I'm coming from a civil engineering background. So this is from a construction engineering, geotechnical engineering background, this example questions. But I believe that the key ingredients you can sort of modify and take and prepare your own assessments. So here I'm giving an example of CPACs where I'm developing the context at the beginning. I'm saying that it's a building construction project and the student here is working with a structural engineer and I'm also using a personal name, Jonathan. Okay, so Jonathan is actually a student within the cohort of my class. And I say that this is a consulting farm and the farm is placed in Gladstone, where I am. And I'm trying to develop all these relationships with the student, the manager, and another structural engineer, and focusing on the overall team, because this is what we do in engineering. We work in a team and we construct building or foundations or whatever. So here I'm introducing the manager. So I'm saying that the manager has decided that the particular type of ground condition, it's very soft and it's not suitable. So then I'm sort of asking the student that can you think what skills equations your manager might have used without any calculations to sort of decide that this type of foundation is not suitable. So again, rather than giving the required numbers directly, I'm saying that Jonathan, who is the structural engineer in the project, from his experience, he suggests that these are the parameters. Okay. 12 minutes. Then at the end, I'm saying, I'm saying that this is the method that we need to use and check whether this method is sort of suitable. So now I'm connecting this with an alternate type of design over here. Okay, so I'm saying that, okay, this equipment that we need is not available. So rather than saying design part B, I'm saying that the equipment needed for part A is not there. So now design part B. Okay. And I'm also saying that there's a single lecture site that covers this. So don't look anywhere else, just look into your lecture notes and give your reasons for the overall problem. So now this whole question can be summarized very briefly in only 53 words. So if you're looking for a quick buck, $20, which question would you take, part one or part two? Obviously the smaller one. So this is a big no-no. So don't design your assessment questions like this smaller one which doesn't have any context. So now at the results and conclusions, so what I did was I sort of tested the CPEX approach for two focus group of students. So one in year two and one in year four. So I had around 41 students in group one and about 32 students in group two. And most of them were sort of in studying in dist distance mood. So 56% of the students were studying in mix or distant mood. And I gave them three questions to solve and I used all these sort of resources to sort of identify and detect contract cheating. And at the end, what I found was that all of these questions still ended up on contract cheating websites. Okay, what a pity. But the good thing was that I covertly, I opened an account on the website that I found the question. And it ended up that out of the three, two of the questions were not answered by the contract cheating website. Okay? So I think the reason is that the solution was pretty long. It's more than 10 pages long. It might be that it's too expensive for them to solve or the student to sort of pay. And the final one, third one, I found it on online and I found a solution, but okay. I found a solution, but the essence of, of the problem was missing. Okay, so in, in conclusion, I would like to say that I presented a revised definition of contract cheating, uh, which I think is more comprehensive. And I've also sort of discussed a new method, which is the CPEX approach. And I think if we follow the CPEX approach, we can get encouraging success. So thank you, everyone. I would love to answer any of your questions at the end. And thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Shah. Can I please everybody thank you um, for your presentation? And just before anybody gets upset, I did give you some extra time because of the interruption. So um, if we, um, if you could, I could just ask you to unshare your screen. That would be great. Um, I actually do have some comments for you, Shah, but I too have to wait until the end of the session before I, um, before I throw in my, my five cents as well, um, even though I've got control of the button. <laughs> okay, so um, now I'd like to welcome Tobias Andreasen from Central Queensland University. Uh, Andreas, uh, yes, uh, Tobias, not Andreas, sorry about that. Tobias, I could see you. Are you ready to go? 
I am ready to go if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Oh. So that's perfect. If you'd like to uh, share your screen, let me know when you're ready to begin and I will um, work out how to... Oh, got it. Look at that. Is that sharing, yeah? Yes, that's perfect, Good. Vice. Thank you very much. Um, right. You're ready to go. Start off whenever you're ready to go. Okay, well, I'm starting off now. Um, so this presentation will be slightly different. Um, it's not about cheating. Um, uh, it's titled Social Innovation Education as a Transformative Experience. Um, and first, just um, um, thanks for, um, to the other speakers. Um, I am Tobias. I'm the Associate Director of Social Innovation at CQU and also one of the Ashukayu Change Leaders. Um, and part of my role is to um, work with the academics and teaching staff to embed social innovation into what we're doing. And this is, uh, I guess, driven by um, two things that the, the new strategy um, identifies that one goal is to create career ready, lifelong learners who have a social innovation mindset. And then that our vision is to effect transformational change in Australia and abroad. So I had to take some notes down so I could fit it into the time. So I'm conscious about that. But um, the, I'm going to try to unpack this a little bit. Uh, the way this is coming from, I guess, is uh, particularly from the Ashuka U um, idea that everyone can be a change maker. So um, CQU is one of uh, or the Australia's only change maker campus. And we've kind of taken this on board um, and believe that everyone can be a change maker. It doesn't matter what you're studying. Um, and um, therefore we embed social innovation into our practice. Social innovation education then has been explained by Rivers and colleagues at the Northampton University, which is another uh, change maker campus as um, a process to developing graduates who aspire to change the world. And regardless of career path, so it can be anyone who studies anything. And the link to transformation, transformative education is the, the idea that transformative education um, is required as an educational approach in order to respond to complex, diverse and polarized world. So for me, these terms comes together and I'm kind of trying to make an argument here, which is guiding my work a bit. And that is, I'm trying to move my picture away here, um, that social education, it, it should be understood as education that does not just inspire students to be change makers. Um, that is usually how it's defined, but it's also um, about catalyzing transformational learning experiences with others to enable them to catalyze that with others, not just with themselves, um, as future leaders and co-creators of our future. So what that means though, what to do that is we need to unpack and explore experiences that can provide students to students that we foster the attitudes and capabilities we believe are required to engage and catalyze transformational experiences with others. So this is what I'm going to try to explore a bit further. So I'm going to start here and um, look at transformational education and transformational learning. And the Lancet Commission wrote a report in 2010 that identified um, uh, three levels of learning and they put transformative learning as the, the highest level of learning. Um, informative learning is the idea that you're building expertise uh, with the right knowledge and skills. And then formative learning is focusing on producing professionals in practice and transformative learning producing enlightened change agents explained and the Lansing Commission focused on a health um, in the health space but this can be um, broadened and um, used in any kind of thinking about any um, learning so the change agents then are the those to have the skills to foster and catalyze the transformation we need they are the change leaders or change makers we use I should use language that we need to tackle um, the grand challenges that we face. Grand challenges, wicked problems, whatever we want to call them. Um, and despite this um, fairly well-known call in 2010 and all the focus on transformation, 
transformative education and so forth. Um, Finnegan identified that our education system have not responded to the challenges posed. Um, this is why it's worthwhile, despite all the talk about transformation, transformational thinking, that we um, really think, are we actually doing it or, um, and how are we doing it? If this is something new to you in terms of what, what we mean by transform transformative experience and transformational learning, a quick little um, um, recap, I guess, um, what it is. So Jack Mesiro, um developed and is, is seen as the one that kind of founded transformational theory in the 70s and has since been tweaking it. He explains it as the process of using a prior interpretation to construe a new or revised interpretation of the meaning of one's experience in order to guide uh, future action. So for Mesero, the aim should be to challenge and change problematic frames of reference. And he explains that what is needed is a disorienting dilemma to kickstart the transformative experience. And this experience can be sudden or it can be a gradual experience over time. So my question is really, how do we prepare adults to be open to this? Um, and then how can they support this within others? The other one worthwhile to reference is uh, Paulo Freire, a Brazilian educator who I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, who wrote The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, available for free um, online um, in the 70s. And he wrote about emancipatory learning that require a transformational experience. And he explained that it's, it's something, in his word, that the oppressed needs to go through, but then also the oppressor. And the idea was that both of them needs to develop this critical consciousness so that they can zoom out and see the bigger picture and their role within it. And then if people do this, they can see the word as a, as a, as a reality, this quote, in transformation. And by being able to see reality as a process and not static, a person can become aware about future potentials, future opportunities for change and betterment. And then Mesero's taken these and explored a bit further, but I think even looking back at Freya's ideas, um, it seems clear that he's focused on problem-solving education, problem-based learning, uh, praxis of doing and theorizing and action learning can be seen as precursors to social innovation education um, because it is focused on encouraging transformational experiences in order to better the current conditions. So that was just a, a quick insight uh, in where I'm getting these terms from. So at CQU, we've um, taken an institution-wide approach to this. Um, so the idea of uh, social innovation and change making, it doesn't sit within one uh, discipline or in one lab, uh, which can be the case. Um, so the Office of Social Innovation, we, we involved quite a lot in co-curricular activities, um, focused on social innovation, human-centered design processes. It is also how we, part of our engagement agenda in terms of how we're working with our communities that is driven by this uh, aim to actually have a positive impact. It is part of the, the research, um, focusing on, on impact there as well and contributing to um, positive outcomes. And of course, in service learning and, and work um, related learning, it's, uh, it's re related, even though it may not be you know, what they're focusing on, but they're still building those capabilities and skills that um, are part of social innovation education. And then uh, we have a um, big part, of course, is the course and unit development uh, um, and assessment and in-class exercises. Um, because as we know, the strategy is identified in that courses should embed social innovation into the curriculum. Uh, so in terms of embedding social innovation then into our curriculum, um, we identified a number of years ago that there's three different levels for this um, relating to the graduate attributes, social innovation mindset. Um, and we expect with these ones that students develop in the introductory one, they're able to um, develop their understanding and expertise about a, a social innovation, social change. In the intermediate level, they 
little bit more critical reflection as a professional. And then in the graduate level, they kind of zoom out and see how they can actually contribute to positive change. And when we think about these three levels um, like that, we can kind of see how they relate to the, uh, the different learning levels in terms of formative, informative, formative, and then transformative. 10 minutes. Oh, um, okay. But um, the other one is um, um, we can also link it to the uh, process for transformational learning in terms of disorientating dilemma, critical reflection, learning with others and take action. So these are um, Mesero's four big kind of steps in the process of for transformational le learning and experiences. Uh, another way to look at this is also to think about the attitudes and competencies required that we identify that's required for social innovation and change making. And these are taken from Ashoka Yu, um, uh, their uh, mindsets and attitudes, and link these, because these do not happen necessarily in that linear process, that they're happening throughout um, in different stages. And that's the same for the transformational learning experiences, that, um, that we can, um, the, that the, uh, for example, that uh, let's see where we are. Uh, if a student's learn to say strengthen their empathy and self awareness, they may experience that their frames of reference are challenged and needs to be tweaked, and then to, to develop an open and adaptive communication capabilities is required uh, when working with others. So there's always connection between these, and they always spin around um, and can be unpacked in that way. But the question is then, how do we do this in practice in our assessments? Um, so to do this, I'm going to present two ways, um, very briefly. And the idea is to look at social innovation as a process of doing it, um, containing a number of different um, steps. And uh, this model can look in a number of different ways. There's uh, one I've sometimes used from the Nesta Innovation Spiral. There's similar models for human-centered design processes, but if it is for social innovation, the point is that it's a, it's a process that aims to achieving sustainable solutions to social problems. 12 minutes. We can splice this up um, and look at each part and think about assessment and class exercises and, and tasks and explore what it means. So in the first one, in terms of learning, um, the, the learning step focuses on understanding problems, and we can use different uh, ethnographic processes for this, uh, interviews and so forth. Uh, the discovery step takes the learning from the learning step and turns them into design opportunities. Uh, how might we respond to the unmet need identified in step one um, or other research, uh, big data, etc. And we can then use um, um, generative design research to identify these opportunities and then we need to respond to those opportunities which is the design phase where you actually do something um, where you can do more creative play to explore solutions with people where you actually uh, trying to come up with some ideas and then of course you need to test this so we can test this we do prototype or, or the ideas that you run a scenario based where you try to be uh, different people in a scenario and you test your solution. And then in this whole process, uh, you need to identify how you're going to measure this and evaluate it, um, which is when you can develop um, a theory of change um, where you identify your actions that are required and the outputs and outcomes for this. And then this goes in an iterative way and then eventually you may identify that you want to set up a social enterprise and you need to identify how you can uh, proceed with that and what, why that would be uh, a viable, desirable, fiscal business. So this whole process, um, the idea with it is even though it's focused on social innovation, the whole one, it can be spliced up and different assessment and tasks can be uh, used to equip the students with the capabilities that are required in each one of them. 14 minutes. So the final one then is to actually look back at those capabilities and attitudes and think of the assignments and look at them and whether or not an assessment, are we providing the empathy and self-awareness? Are we developing deep and generative research? And these are not graduate attributes, but they are 
ways to kind of assess what we're doing and then thinking, okay, if we're not doing this, um, we may need to think of how can we do it? How can we change what we're doing? And how can we build on what we're doing to start building these uh, capabilities and attitudes in a more intentional way so that uh, students will get a more of a transformational experience um, through their education. I think that uh, is it, and hopefully I'm on time and it wasn't too rushed. Thank you. You, you hit it right on the very second, so well done, well done on that. To the very second, Tobias, awesome. Um, thank you very much. Can everybody please thank Tobias for his time this morning? Um, and I just ask if Ray Jobs, if you're ready to go. No, I can only hear crickets. I have seen Ray's name popped up earlier. She's there, Sharon. Yeah, I could see. Hello, speak again, Ray. You look like you were just made. Ray, please talk. We can hear you now. I just heard you put your headset down. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. I was hoping the headset was a better sound, but that. <laughs> no, that's okay. Could I please ask everybody uh, to thank um, Tobias? I've, I've done that bit, ticked that off my list. And now, um, Ray, thank you so much for joining us. You are um, uh, Ray Jobs from Griffith University. And your presentation this morning is MBA assessment that counts. Could I please ask you all to welcome Ray to Central Queensland University. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Um, and I really want to thank the CQU for um, the opportunity. What a great uh, event. So this morning's um, keynote uh, by Nick, I'm just trying to share my, there we go. Um, really links in with this presentation a lot um, and also some of the other speakers in this session. So um, as I mentioned, thanks so much to CQU for welcoming us from Griffith. Online also is uh, the Griffith Online Manager, Marie Zamansky. Marie, would you like to just say hello? Hey guys, just here supporting Ray. <laughs> Not really. Well, she is supporting me for this presentation, which is wonderful. But um, Marie was the project manager for this project that um, I'll be talking with you about. So, um, and as we go through this session, um, Marie's approach the, to the project management, I think, was one of the critical factors that made this really a dream project. So, every time I talk about this project, I say, this was really such a dream, like the, we had committed teaching staff, we had a clear, I guess, direction and an idea of what um, we wanted to achieve and how this project was going to enhance the student experience. And so I think, um, you know, having that really tight project management of a complex uh, task really helped us. So um, I, I have to say, usually when I do presentations, I have oodles of slides with a couple of words on each one or a photo or something. So it was a challenge for me to put um, a presentation into four slides, but um, it kind of really helped me think about how to structure the presentation. So were we looking at the beginning, the middle and the end of the project? So the beginning um, really, and there was obviously a beginning before the workshop and lunch, but for me, I think part of the success of this project was that all of the lead conveners, which is the Griffith term for um, the person who kind of has carriage of each course and I think you might call your courses units and then degrees we have programs and then courses so um, each lead convener came to a workshop and we had lunch and it was very collegial and um, because in the MBA people come from dis different disciplines so it was a really great way to have commitment from all of these people to building or modifying an existing degree, the Accelerated Online MBA 
so that students had a, um, a program that really, really gave them good value for their investment in terms of their career. So that's what we were really hoping for. Then the, the program director had really strong commitment um, and was very clear with people that they wanted to think each person to think creatively about how their particular course um, would help each student in their career, either their current career or their future career and hopefully life. Um, and then we had an agreed set of principles and so the alignment aspect that learning outcomes, assessment and course content were really strongly aligned. Um, that the assessment tasks and the focus of this project was on the assessment within each course, that the assessment tasks were as much as possible authentic and transferable. And so we, we would talk about assessment being portfolio worthy, like something that you could link into via your CV or your LinkedIn profile, um, that you could share if you were having promotion conversations in your workplace. So um, that it was something that was really shareable and demonstrated your skills. And in that, that we were really building students' ability to articulate the skills that they were building throughout each course in the MBA. Um, collaboration, that we were looking for opportunities for collaboration for students within their studies that weren't just about group work, um, which we know some students aren't excited about oftentimes, but that it might be a conversation about giving and receiving feedback. And then we explained that to students by linking that to those capability frameworks that are around um, for leadership and management. So that giving and receiving feedback is one of the critical skills within those capability frameworks. We also looked at the MBA values, the Griffith graduate attributes, um, and we wanted assessment that was sustainable and scaffolded across the program. So that um, as students within this particular program, there's two tiers. So the first tier is the graduate certificate, which is four courses, and then the second tier is the remaining courses, which is eight courses. Um, and one of the things that um, was really great at, right at the start was Marie Hughes' Microsoft Planner to set tasks for each course and then at a program level. And she also created this massive Excel sheet, which had a sheet for each um, course. It really helped us with our conversations. And it also meant that um, each meeting, each conversation that we had with each academic, they could see that this was part of an overall strategy. Everybody else was on board with doing this and um, they were part of a consistent approach. So in the middle, we reviewed, uh, we reviewed learning outcomes. And as you can see by this example here, we, the learning outcomes throughout the MBA were pretty good in terms of reflecting the AQF level nine and, you know, Bloom's taxonomy about reflecting professional judgment. So I had to really search for one that wasn't so great in terms of measurability and level. But this was an example, appreciate the rationale for government intervention. And then the new outcomes were, became things like the second one, investigate topical economic issues, applying principles to construct explanations accessible to non-professional audiences. So already that's giving you a hint about what the um, assessment might be. So in that particular course, um, which is economics, um, the assessment moved from being an academic research paper to constructing two blog articles um, that would be able to be published in industry 
relevant blogs. So um, research was still important, um, but that ability to be concise um, and to explain things quite simply um, was re also really important and is in, built into the assessment plan for that course. And in that process, we met a couple of times, at least with each um, convener. We looked at the program learning outcomes and each course was assigned a program learning outcome that they were measuring and collecting data for. Um, we looked at the career related skills and I'll show you some snapshots of how we mapped that. We had a strong focus, the key focus was on authenticity of the assessment tasks. Assessment was mapped against the MBA values and I can quickly show you what they look like. So this is available on our um, Griffiths website. There's three MBA values, responsible leadership, sustainable business practices and an Asia Pacific perspective. So these have some tie-ins with what Tobias was just talking about in terms of social innovation in his um, particular area. Um, and we also looked at mapping to the Griffith graduate attributes, which are on this page here as well. So these, again, innovation, creativity, social responsibility and so on. Okay, so we did a lot of mapping of that. We also mapped the format of assessment so that there was a diversity of formats, um, but not so diverse that students um, felt stressed by having to be too agile. So we really tried to achieve a balance. And then also with the technology, we looked at what new types of technology are we asking these students there and I didn't mention this right at the start this is a fully online course so what technology are we challenging our students to um, use and then how are we scaffolding that thank you Sharon um, and then also the opportunities for collaboration um, as well so we mapped that so in the end we had a strong, cohesive program. We had a committed and capable teaching staff. So every conversation, we were learning more about their teaching experience and their discipline. And um, the teaching staff themselves were le learning more about, um, you know, how to translate their discipline for their students. Um, there, we created a resource that explained the design and there were more explicit links between assessment and career relevant skills. So the light orange box is some feedback that was shared in Microsoft Teams in a recent course um, for Luke Horton teaches that course. This student did the, you know, this is dream feedback. They said, I've been able to apply the theory in practice um, they did a previous course with Luke on data analysis. They mentioned that they've revolutionised their workplace by understanding data and how to use it. So they've linked managerial problem solving, which was the most recent course, with data analysis and their workplace. So that's really getting that meta level of learning happening. Um, so great feedback there from that student. Um, and on the right, you'll see a screenshot from the course site. And we include this feed, this information regard for every assessment in MBA now. So how is this going to strengthen your skills? Well, thank you, Sharon. And um, we're also building a collect and reflect portfolio using Pebble Pad, which is an optional activity that, where students can upload their assessments um, they can also upload other things that are career relevant and they also can um, answer some critical reflection questions. So that's, um, and PebblePad is accessible to Griffith students once they graduate. So that's um, one of the key reasons why we're using that. So they can 
continue to access it while they're a student as well as after they graduate. Last um, slide is a collection of um, slides from our uh, final report. Um, so up in the top left corner, you can see a snapshot of how we looked at the technology that is used in the graduate certificate part of the program and then the latter courses. So we really rationalised the, um, the technology that students are using. This middle snapshot is the career relevant skills and we mapped them across every course. Um, so we could see actually where um, we had lots of strong representation. This slide here with the boxes shows the reduction in word count right across the degree. And some of that was due to converting written assignments to video tasks, for instance, and also to more relevant industry related writing tasks. The large image is a snapshot from managerial problem solving and you can see here that we looked at the um, problem-based learning. Thank you that Tobias mentioned. Um, so each assessment is related to the same problem and that problem is identified by the student themselves. Um, and this last image is a snapshot of the mapping of the graduate attributes across every course. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Could I please um, have everybody thank Ray for her presentation? Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd just like to ask Joe, Ritesh, Edward, Shah, Tobias and Ray to be ready to be ready because now I'm opening it up to questions. So can I please ask that you um, wave your arms around to try and get my attention might be the easiest way. Um, and I will call your name rather than everybody trying to jump on. And just make sure that you um, identify who your question is for given that it's across all of the presentations. So who has a, um, who has a question first please? I don't like it when I hear crickets. That's a bad sign. <laughs> I do have a question for Tobias that did come through the um, the Zoom session. Um, sorry, is is Michael asking a question? Michael, um, you're muted. Would you like to ask a question? You're muted, sorry, Michael. Down the bottom left-hand corner, you should see a little... Um, okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, well done. Thank you, thank you very much, Sharon. And uh, well done to all the presenters, to Joe, Ratish and Ed. I met you at the Melbourne uh, Focus Group. Uh, keep up the good work you're doing. So my uh, question is to uh, Tobias. Uh, it's not so much a question, it's more like my thinking out loud. Um, I suppose it is some sort of a rhetorical question. So to Tobias, I enjoyed your presentation. I have an interest uh, in the topic, much stronger in the past than at present for a variety of reasons I won't go into. Um, so thinking out loud, as I was listening to your presentation, uh, I, I want to sort of, uh, Put you back in time. I want you to imagine that uh, you were sent to uh, another university to teach about one or two years ago. So I'm specifically thinking of the University of Hong Kong and in particular what's been happening in Hong Kong in the last three months. Um, I cannot help but feel, you know, someone like you with your interests, how would you approach teaching a group of university students in, say, the University of Hong Kong about 12 years ago, uh, and knowing what's going to happen in the last three months, because your uh, approach, uh, transformative learning and all that, is, um, I think, very politicized. It's very ideological based. It's based on values. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about how you could use some template or some protocol like that 
in, in the Hong Kong situation. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty difficult question. Um, thanks for... Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I did say it's a rhetorical question, so you don't have to answer it, but yeah. I, I'd be interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I'm not sure how to answer it, but I guess for me, the my angle on it, and I don't know if it came across um, as strong as it should have, is normally transformational learning, and uh, we talk about that as an individual kind of experience, you transforming your frames of references and so forth, but and we can do that by, we usually use it in the context of sending a student overseas and, uh, or getting them engaged in a particular thing. Um, but for me, the problem with that is if they're not, if we're not also thinking how we can intentionally make sure that they are also able to um, curate or catalyze that with others um, in a group as a change leader uh, or a change agent, if they're not able to do that, I think we'll have the problems that we do have. Um, and I think the solution, well, one solution hopefully to these kind of clashing of, of views is that people are not really equipped with actually moving over to the other side and uh, developing understanding for how they see the word. Um, so yeah, um, mm. I think the one, Solution would be to explore that further, I think, I would mm -hmm. say, without giving you a clear answer, because, yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, does anybody else have another question? Okay. I, I, I won't hit you again, Tobias. I'll save that one further down the list, because it's, it's actually on the chat room, so I won't hit you straight away. Um, the question I have, a statement and a question, is actually for Shah. Uh, very interesting, um, very interesting definition that you have on who's involved in contract cheating, where you include family members. Given that CQ University, um, which is the only one I can speak for at the moment, we're low socioeconomic and first in family, it's not uncommon that families assist. And so, where is that line? Um, would be my sort of statement rather than a question. But my question is that. Um, the personalization that you're talking about aligns with the vision of assessment that Nick has been speaking about lately. Were you already identifying this or is this part of our process that you've um, become involved in? Has Shah left us now that I've gone and done that nice big long worded question? <laughs> I think he has. <laughs> well, the statement's there. It's in the recording forever and ever now. So if it's on the internet, it's there forever, isn't it? Um, any more questions, please? I just had one, if I can speak. Uh, yes. on, the first, on the first presentation with regard to uh, academic misconduct, I, I was thinking actually um, it would be really good to speed up the process of how, uh, in terms of misconduct, is recognized what is what is actually misconduct and not beyond whatever that is accepted now. Like, for example, the false references and also you know words being replaced. So those kind of things. If if we can find solutions to that fast, we can also try and um, as long as everybody is on board on a teaching team, then 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 kind of detecting them would be much more easier and. Uh, then there is recognition across everybody in in terms of a whole team. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for that. I I don't really think it's a question. I think that was a suggestion, and and yeah, we're all on board with with wanting to do that um, because in uh, engineering and technology, and I assume the same is in business and law. We're we're working with like large teams. Sometimes you know twelve, fifteen people, of which most of them are sessional staff. So yeah. The, the sooner that we can all get to a common understanding of what's academic misconduct, what isn't, and how best to teach the students, the better. So that's one of the objectives of, of, of the project is to, yeah, to have resources there that, that help that common understanding. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thank you. Can I just add to that, uh, Riaz, uh, thank you for the comment. Um, 
Josh has just put some information um, in the chat screen. And further to that information, um, I, it is my understanding that there will be um, an online training module that will be rolled out soon by Learning and Teaching Services, which will, I mean, the, the whole purpose is so people have a common understanding of academic integrity and uh, misconduct. We've got Renette, who is online as well. Uh, she or Josh might want to add something else. Thank you. If I might jump in there, Sharon, taking over your role, <laughs> I might respond to that. Yes, we have the staff um, academic integrity uh, module that will soon be available to all staff to work their way through these five modules. Um, and it's from the basics of what it is up to how to identify typical scenarios, some um, fairly interactive, some videos from other universities. So the content is I think quite powerful and it will be available to start very shortly. Um, simultaneously, we have the Academic Integrity in Action. So it's our a toolkit that's um, we're being developed and that's where the other team are, um, who have the SALT grant will also contribute some resources where it's about um, detecting as well as preventing and there will also be a fair few um, PD sessions available for staff. Um, some new and some also just refreshes. Thanks. Thank you, Renette. You're not jumping in at all because you can answer that question far better than I could. So that's that's your role. <laughs> um, any more questions, please? Um, can I just say that one of the comments that um, uh, on the chat I thought was really interesting was about how much effort some people put into cheating and how that would, be, you know, why did they put that into cheating when they could, you know, with the same amount of effort put it into actually writing the assessment in the first place. And I thought that was a very good question. I've pondered that myself. Uh, some people go to enormous lengths to, to purchase or create um, th this, you know, assessment like through using a synonym generator whatever uh, whereas if they just sat down and engaged with the content one would think that they would come up with a better assignment quicker in the end so yeah, that might be a, a, another project for the future is to look at what the mentality of the students and why they do that thank you joe that's interesting i'm wondering um the same thing but then i also have a teenage son so i don't wonder it too deeply but um <laughs> but absolutely i would have to agree tobias you've got a question yeah, a question and a comment, I guess, in terms of connecting the presentations a little bit. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any work, um, I don't know if Ritesh and Joe knows, uh, any work around exploring different types of um, ways of assessing. And, and I'm thinking the last part of my presentation when I kind of rushed through a bit of how we can go about um, um, using different parts of the social innovation process to develop assessment and class task. Um, because there's the traditionally and of course it's all about writing and uh, that's when it becomes really easy to um, go online and so forth but you know I don't know how easy it is in certain disciplines to come up with some ways of creating assessment that are more you know performance based or more um, um, actually physical creating something that so therefore that would limit the potential for cheating maybe and maybe there's that's a space to explore even further. Comment maybe more than a question. Thank you, Tobias. Joe, have you got any comment to make on the comment or are you? Um, yeah, no, that, that's good. In, in that particular unit that the three of us were in, involved with that sort of in, you know, influence us to do the project. Um, it's called Professional Skills and it's about communication and um, uh, like the soft skills used in information and communication technologies. So we do have, we did have a presentation assessment as well as the written report assessment and then um, other assessments there. So, um, and, and yet traditionally the students did do better in the presentation than what, than what they did in the, the report, the written report. Um, but equally, they also cheated with their presentation. So they would, um, even though they were given lots of uh, free reign what they're going to do the presentations on they often copied things from the internet they often copied from presentations from years gone by <laughs> whatever so there were still um problems of academic integrity even with their powerpoint presentations or you know however they chose to present it
thank you, Joe. I, um, I, I just try and think of it from my point of view and to actually cheat on a presentation would be terrifying because you know that it's not your work and you'd be waiting, but that's me. I'm, that's just the way I am, I guess. Oh. And they, they could present on anything, anything of interest to them. So there was no need for them to cheat. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have any other questions for our presenters today? Um, just being mindful, I'm flicking between two screens of... Um... I do, Sharon. Yes, please, Glo. One for Joe. Joe, does this mean, um, because I have presentation as one of my wound care assessment things, do you change the assessment significantly or do you think that freedom of giving them the choice of what they want to present on actually can lead them towards contract cheating because it is so accessible? Um, yeah, well, I, that's good. I mean, because most of the students are from, you know, an international background, um, what, and th that presentation was like earlier in the term, one of the reasons that, that we gave them free reign was because we wanted them to feel comfortable. They could have talked about something that of you know, interest to them. Um, but again, yeah, I, I don't, don't know why they chose to, you know, plagiarise the PowerPoints from, from previous students. I didn't look at it. I'm not actually involved in the teaching of that unit um, at the moment, so I haven't. I, I know that the current unit coordinator is exploring different options there with the assessment of, of how to avoid plagiarism. But um, but yeah, I I would have thought that that doing that presentation was a lay down misere or something that was easy for them to do. Yeah. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Glow. Any more questions? Um, I'll ch chip in, Sharon, if if I could. It's um, I'm Ed Pember. I'm in Melbourne. I work with Joe and Ritesh on the on the project. Um, Tobias, maybe hitting one of your questions about a bit, a bit more, you know, a, a slant on different types of assessment in the research or the investigations I was doing as to what. Um, resources we have on academic integrity around the university. I ended up talking to the Ellicos, um, is it called CQU English in Melbourne, and, and they were doing some really interesting work using Google Docs to actually build the assignment week by week, which is something that I was really interested in, and I think we should all be having a good look at that as, a, as an example of how we can scaffold it with them, uh, with the students. And I, I think, you know, another comment perhaps that rather than a question, a comment to the group is, you know, there's a lot of talk about this and we all seem to be very interested in it. I think from your presentation, Tobias, and also I think it's Ray, I hope I've got your name pronounced correctly. Um, you know, it seems to be the, the background of what you, 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 those two presentations were saying was that there needs to be a lot more lecturer engagement involved in the in the in in the assessment process and and I think all of this is going in a great direction but it is going to cost a lot of money and I think that, that needs to actually really be said out you know out there that if you want these assessments to work and you want the university to change we need to be paying sessional staff and other other staff the time that it takes to do all that work thanks thanks Edward Anybody else? I'm very mindful of the time. We have a few minutes left. Could I just um, comment on what Edward just said? Um, I think that's really, really important, Edward, and in redesigning the assessment across the, that online MBA, we were conscious sustainability in terms of the marking process was one of the key principles. So we we're very conscious about the time involved in marking. So, and hopefully um, we actually reduce that in some senses, although maybe we shifted it in terms of students probably needed more coaching about how to actually complete some of the tasks because they were a bit different. Thank you, Ray. Okay, please, if there's anybody else, I, I will wrap it up if there's any other questions. Um, Sharon, on behalf of all the presenters, I'd just like to thank you for um, the professionalism you used into help, helping direct us today and giving us our little cues about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever. I appreciated that. Thank you. We all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Um,
so on that note now, I'm just, look, I'm blushing now. So thanks, Joe. <laughs> no, look, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and I do want to say, yay, no technical difficulties. So we need a clap for that, I think. We got through it perfectly. We had one little hiccup with some a microphone not closed and we sorted that out. So we're all good and that's perfect. Um, thank you all very much for attending. The, I think these are incredible because even though I'm facilitating, I still have been listening and been able to tick off a couple of my smaller tasks that are time, um, time urgent in my own work life. So please don't think I wasn't listening. I was, I've got questions written on my other screen as well. So I'm not, I have been listening, but it's been fantastic. Thank you so much um, for all the presenters. And I would like to say a thank you to those people behind the scenes too, that are checking on the technical stuff, because without them, I would crawl under my desk and cry when there's a problem. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, if you want to continue chatting, that's fine. But my job is now done. And um, don't forget the evaluation. Yes, it is for every session. And it's important if you'd like to nominate the best or most thought provoking presentation as well. Um, and that's all I have to say. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, Sharon.